Turn your Bibles to Exodus 22. Exodus 22. We're going to be in a few places this morning. So um, on Sundays, I usually say, you know, you're going to be in one or two spots. So put a tassel. I'm going to tell you to put a tassel somewhere here. But we are going to be in a few places um, as we start to wrap in the message. And we're going to see a lot of the New Testament in Jesus' teachings in Matthew. And we're going to be in First Peter. But go ahead and put your tassel in First Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. When we get to that point, it's going to flow very quickly. And so I want you to be there. But if you don't have a Bible, there should be a black hardbound Bible around you. If you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you. Take it home with you. But I encourage you. You'll hear me say highlight. You'll hear me encourage you to be active in the message. So no matter how old you are, if you're a young person... Um, does not matter. I want your Bibles open. Um, If you can barely read, barely is good enough. And so I want your Bibles open starting off in Exodus 22. And so would you do me a favor if you are a highlighter or if you take notes within your Bible or maybe you have a journal? And I made sure that that I took note in my phone so I didn't I didn't mess it up. I thought it was beautiful in the song um, that I thought that, I mean, I got to say this because it really goes along with the message. If you are a note taker, write this. If you gladly choose surrender, so will I. Will you, will you write that down somewhere? If you gladly chose surrender, so will, you, so will I. So this morning's message is a call to be different, a call to be different. So let's read God's Word 26 through 31, and then my son Liam is going to pray us into the message. So Liam, come on up, buddy. Look at God's Word. This is where we left off last week. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people." You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices. The firstborn of your sons you shall give me. Likewise, you shall do with your oxen and your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days, and on the eighth day you shall give it to me. Will you highlight verses 31? We're going to reference it a handful of times. This is who you and I are in the light of God's perfection, children of the Lord, and you shall be holy men to me. You shall not eat meat torn by beast in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. Bow our heads and Liam, pray us in. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day, and thank you for allowing us to have another day to worship you. And please allow us to understand this message and feel how it's connected to us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I don't know what to do with this thing. <laughs> so it's a call to be different. And so if you have been here any length of time, we are seven or eight months into Exodus. God has been amazing. I have loved each and every week. And as we find ourselves in week four of our study through the book of the covenant, the perspective and the approach that we have taken in really teaching this has really been connected to God, the perfect Father. And so that is the perspective that we have taken, that God, speaking to the Israelites, speaking through Moses, seeing his children, those he calls his, he is parenting these children who were former slaves. He is building and growing them and equipping them to be free children In his image, our God is a perfect father. So this is week four. 
And so it's very important that we always kind of refresh and we see the progression of God's Word and where we are in this study. Week one, three weeks ago, we talked about God the Father, the perfect parent. He cares about everything and is a call to new life. That you are mine, you are chosen, you are love, you are made in my image. I see you as children. I am intentional, I am invested, and I am interested in every aspect of your life. As much as I try to be super dad, I fail in the ways that God never fails. That my God is perfect. He is the perfect Father. Week two, our Father is a balanced Father. He calls us to order. Not only does He call us to new life, He is perfectly balanced. He is perfectly gentle and perfectly in discipline. We see a perfect balance. Parent, how hard is that? How hard is it to be the the one who is gentle and loving and affectionate and then also be the one who's the disciplinarian? And so, so many times within the human home, we struggle with making sure that we can do half that in a man's life. And so God is perfect in balance, gentle and graceful and merciful, but then also is a God who calls us to order. Last week was a call to maturity. It was a call to maturity. It was a call to discipleship. God does not just save his children. He walks with his children. And so on Wednesday night, for two Wednesdays in a row, we did it again Wednesday night, this week. And then we saw it last Sunday. Not only does God see that we are saved, but after salvation, he walks with us in sanctification to mature his children. That is really what we see in the book of the covenant. He is building and growing and equipping his children. And now this week, we see the progression. This week, we see a call to be different. And so each and every week, as we found ourselves in the book of the covenant, we call you not to just see who God is, but also to what God is doing. Not to just who God is as the perfect parent, but actually see how he's parenting. And what is God doing in the book of the covenant? He has his free people. He is growing this community, this family, this unit, this community. And he is perfectly parenting by building these people. That's what parents do. Parents teach, and they provide, and they love, and they they give shelter. They are affectionate. But what are parents doing? They are human architects. That is what we do as moms and dads. We pour into, we take out of, we guide, we encourage, we give advice, we walk with, we model. We are building these little people. Parents are human architects. And so I often think, I've said this to many of my friends, I think there will be a day where My brother Ben Canavan and I are sitting together having a cup of coffee. The kids are out of the house. We're going to talk about the good and the bad. Right, parent? And I'm going to say, Ben, how'd you do? How the girls working out? He's like, well, you know, I put a little bit too much in that beaker, and I didn't put enough in that beaker. And that one I did halfway well, but man, I don't know why I did this during this season of their life. And the reason that he's going to say that and I'm going to say that is we aren't perfect parents, Right? But with God our Father, His parenting, His blueprints are perfect. With God the Father, His beakers are perfectly measured. Do you hear that? In God the Father, you and I children, in submission to perfect parenting, God's beakers are perfectly measured. God's blueprints for marriage? Perfect. God's blueprint for money? Perfect. Perfect. God's blueprint for relationships? Perfect. As children, when we submit our lives to perfect parenting, then we faithfully prosper. We grow. That's what the book of the covenant is. This is how you should live in faithful blessings and prosperity. 
We see the same thing in the New Testament as I referenced last week with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is not just preaching. He's telling the people who will follow him, this is how you should live. And so we see this. I was talking to a mama just this morning about it. In the earthly perspective, if you do fill those little beakers to the best of your ability and you perfectly parent in certain aspects of your life, the child still has to submit to it, right? And so there might be a day where Ben goes, hey, man, like, I know I'm not perfect, but man, that measurement looked good to me. What happened? Well, Ben can't submit for his children, So children of God still have to submit to the perfect parenting of God the Father. So here's the challenge in this. The challenge is not perfect parenting. God has that. God is not worried. God is not stressed. God is not overwhelmed. God is not tired. God is not on the defense. God is not crossing his fingers. As a mama and daddy, you know when you wear down and you need a break? God does not need a break with you. You do not overwhelm the Lord. God is not getting advice from other people about how to best parent you. God is sovereign, in control, knows all. He is doing just fine. God, the Father, the issue is not perfect parenting. The challenge is being a child of a perfect parent. I told you to highlight verse 31. There are times that we just want to eat meat torn by the beast. I told you to highlight, and you shall be holy men to me. You are my children. You are mine, made in my image, created before the beginning of time. You shall not eat meat torn by the beast in the field. You shall throw that to the dogs. The challenge in our earthly walks is not our parent. It's being a child of the perfect parent. There are times that we want to eat meat torn by the beast. There are times that we do not always want what's best for us. Even when we know what's best for us. There are times when sane, logical, halfway educated individuals choose pain. There are times that I know this is not good for me still going to walk down this road. There are times that we desire acceptance of the world than obedience to a perfect father. Isn't that crazy? There are times that we choose meat torn by the beast than steak with the father. Why is that? Slow it down. Why is that? Like if you are a believer here today and you believe God's word is the authority on not just what we believe but how to live, why would you and I ever choose otherwise? And so you go, hey, Hunter, I can answer that one real quick. I know that one. Pick me. We're sinners. Yes, we are sinners, but keep digging. What is the sin in this midst? Why does Hunter choose things that are going to hurt me? Why does Hunter choose ways that are not God-honoring? Why does Hunter choose ways that are not going to glorify God and be for my best? Why does Hunter do this? Well, Hunter is a broken, flawed sinner. But at the core of the sin that we struggle with is that in the midst of perfection, perfection creates loneliness. Perfection can oftentimes seem less desirable than the meat in the field torn by the beast. Perfection and obedience and wisdom and knowledge can at times feel not enough. There are moments, man, as an earthly father, where I actually do pour the beakers pretty spot on. And in those moments, rarely do my children come to me and go, hey, Dad, I see what you're doing there. High five. Good job. Like, yes, I want to do what everybody else is doing, but I see where your mind's at. I know it's going to be good for me later on. And man, I'm with you. I'm going to be upstairs reading the Bible. Very rarely happens. Now, there are times my children come to me and bless me and go, man, you're an awesome dad. Thank you. I love my parents. They'll be praying. Thank you for my mama. Thank you for my daddy. 
Thank you for giving to me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for taking care of me. But when the world is doing other things, hang with me. When the world is doing other things and we sit with my children and we go, hey, we're not going to do this. We're not going to choose to walk down the road that many walk down. Rarely do the pastor's kids go, amen. I'm with you. Oftentimes they go, hey, I kind of want to walk down the road everybody else is walking. Why? Why? Why does the crowd seem more desirable than the Father? Because time with the Father can oftentimes be lonely. Time with the Father can seem not enough or less desirable. I see this moment from the perspective that we've taken in Exodus of God the Father speaking to the children and the Israelites and the Lord speaking to you and I as children of His. I see this moment in the conversation of where we are in 23. If you're a note taker, just write it. But everyone else is. Just write it. But everyone else is, Dad. And so look at verses 1. For my young people, I think this will be a blessing to you. Hang with me. I think it is hard to be a young person and, and be different, right? And so hang with me. Look at your word, and I want you to highlight verses 1 and 2. We're just going to read these two verses right now. So God is talking to the Israelites. The Father is speaking to His children. He is raising faithfulness. He is building them up. He is pouring His beakers. And this is the message He has for them this morning. He says, You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Now really highlight it. Stay with me. Be engaged. This is the crux of the message today. You shall not follow, do what you got to do, highlight, circle, underline, do it, whatever, the crowd. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. So I want you to see the progression, church. You are saved. You are mine. You are free. There is order. There is rules. But I will faithfully disciple and walk with you. But there will be times in your life where others choose not to. You are free. You are saved. You are mine. There is a way to walk and a way not to walk. But I promise I will always be with you this week. But there will be times where others choose not to. And so what we see in verses 1 and 2, we see a specific issue pertaining to an overarching problem. And so what is the specific issue? It gives us in verse 1. You shall not circulate a false report. And so what it is saying here, something that we could have preached a sermon on this. He says, listen, if you don't know this to be factual, son, if you don't know this to be true, then don't go around stirring the pot, bringing gossip, hurting others, speaking in ways that you don't know to be accurate. Do not do that. It is harmful. It is dangerous. It is unfaithful and unkind and lacks grace. Do not go speaking about things in a truthful way that you don't know to be factual. You ever fail at this? You ever been in the midst of this? Someone will be speaking to you like, whoa, man, is this true? Well, I heard it. It was true. Someone else said that it was true. True, And what you like to do is you like to be divisional and dramatic and you like to stir the pot because that's what the crowd likes to do. I like gossip. I like drama. It's not fun to talk about things going well. It's not fun to talk about wisdom. It's not fun to talk about faith. Like I need something raunchy, right? God the Father looks at his son and says, do not go out speaking about things you don't know to be accurate. Now that is the specific issue. What is the overarching problem? It says, do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. 
And so the specific issue is, do not stir the pot. The problem is, what drives so many of us to do such a thing, and that is because so many others are. The problem is our sinful, broken nature. The problem is the crowd, and the problem is the desire to do, to be a part of it. So I told you to highlight one word. I want you to highlight two in verse 2, highlight the word crowd and highlight the word many. Highlight, underline the word crowd and also highlight the word many, which is the crux of the situation that plagues many of us. Freedom and obedience and faith can feel like a lonely place. Freedom in faith and obedience in order in discipleship to perfect parenting can feel like a lonely place. We see this from the overarching idea of salvation all the, and the idea of places in salvation. And so for someone, you might feel like, man, I feel like such an outsider as a believer, I don't have Christians around me. I don't have believers around me in my family. I'm an alien. We're going to talk about that. I'm an alien even in within my own home because I am just saved. But some of you might feel like you are not a part of the crowd even in the midst of people who are saved. We know people who are saved by God's grace and will be in God's glory, but they have gone down different roads in their life, and there are sections of their life where you feel like, man, I feel like I am lonely even in the midst with other believers. As believers, young person, listen. As believers, freed, saved, children of God, perfectly parented, we are called not to be a part of the crowd. We are called not to be one of the many. We are called to be different. Write it down. We are called to be different. However, it's easier said than done. It is easier said than done. In Exodus, so far in God's covenant story, God is building his people. You're saved. I've given you grace, I've given you love, I've given you mercy, I am teaching you, I am equipping you, I've given you order and structure and discipleship. And there's this moment that I picture in my head of a father talking to his son and saying, listen, son, there's going to be a day where all the things that you hear, there's going to be many people around you that choose not to do this. And the son goes, who? And the father says, many. All the things that you have learned from me, all the ways that I have taught you, how I have poured into you, the way that you choose to live, there's going to be a day, man, where not a lot of people are doing this. And the young son goes, man, who? Many. Mom and dad, do you ever have moments where you talk to your young person about drugs or alcohol or violence or something of that nature that might not be good for them, and they look at you like you're crazy, like, Dad, Dad I'll never do such a thing. Why, why are you, who does these things? And you go, the majority. The majority? The majority. I'll never do such a thing. Stay faithful, son. Because there's going to be a day where 8 turns into 9 and 9 turns into 15 and 15 turns into 30. And it's hard to be lonely. And the Father says that if you follow what I have told you, if you obey my commands, there's going to be a time where your faith and your belief and your obedience separates you from the crowd. Why do we have such a hard part in that? It's because loneliness is challenging. Loneliness in faith is easier said than done. And so I said that word alien. You might be new to the church, you might be visiting, or you might need a refresher, but that is a word, that is a verse in Scripture, that is an idea and a theology that we speak very often here, that you and I are called to be 
aliens. I was talking to one of my kids this morning, and he said to me, Dad, what are you preaching on today? And I said, Son, I'm preaching on being different. And you know what he said? An alien? He goes, man, we say that word so often. Mamas and daddies, what do we preach here? You and I are raising what? Aliens. And we say it all the time. And this is the importance of the church. Hear me? Rabbit trail, okay? Not on the notes. We say it all the time here. If our children are not going to fit in in the world out there, well, they better find life here. They better find life here. And that is the importance of the church and why you're called not to do it alone. My kids are not meant or called to fit in into the world. So they better find life here with these people. It's a language we speak. It is a vocabulary that we know. And you don't have to flip in the Bible. I just want you to hear that it's not just something that we pulled from our back pocket. In 1 Peter 2, it says, Beloved, I beg you as aliens. I beg you as aliens and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, when they stir your pot up, When they try to come against you, that they may, by your good works and your lifestyle, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation, may your lifestyle be so foreign and a different language of a different universe that even when they speak against you, it sounds ridiculous. That's what it says. And so many of us will go, man, praise God. I hope we all heard this. My kids, did you hear? Alien, alien, alien. There's a message that needs to be preached more often. However, however, I would believe, and I guess that even though it could not be preached enough, it is a message that many of us know and assume already. The issue is not always hearing it. It's, is our heart prepared, and are we ready for the loneliness that it brings? Do you understand what alien status requires in 2022 in your life? What does an alien look like? I wish small groups was tonight, David. What what does alien status look like in 2022? Are you an alien? Is alien status in 2022 someone who speaks the name of Jesus in all settings? I'll speak the name of Jesus to employees, to bosses... When I'm out on a sales call, when I'm coaching baseball, when I'm raising my kids, when I'm talking to my wife, when I'm deer hunting, when I'm spending time with coffee, is an alien someone who says, listen, there is nothing you can do to me that would prevent me from saying the name of Jesus. Is that an alien? I would say so. Is an alien someone who serves when they're tired and who gives when they're tight? I would say so. Is an alien a mama and a daddy who focuses more on a godly family and a focus of it more than their careers and hobbies? I would say so. Is an alien someone who shows grace to the enemy? Who cares more about scripture and obedience to the Lord than acceptance on Facebook? I would say so. Is an alien someone who cares more about their faith than their fortune I would say so. How many people are on that journey, on that road with you? If you were to choose that lifestyle, which I just read off to you, spoiler alert, you're going to walk down a road that does not consist of many people walking with you. And so it begs the question, how many people are on your road? Is it crowded? Because if your road is crowded, I would guess that you're probably going in the wrong direction. Take a second. How crowded is your road? Are you walking with the many? Are you a part of the crowd? Because if so, as comforting as it might be, I'm guessing that you're probably walking in the wrong direction. And you say, well, Hunter, what constitutes a crowd and what does it mean by evil? Evil is 
psychopath, psychopath serial killer type lifestyle. No, evil is literally defined of anything against God's way. Proverbs 115, which we really see in our heart, is really a lot of the issue. It says, my son, do not walk in the ways with them. Man, hear this. Hold back your foot from their paths. And so what we see is so hard in a faithful man's life, in a faithful parent's life, in a faithful friend's life. What we see is God does not just call us to stop and not walk. He actually calls us to pull back. And what's so hard is when the majority of the people in your life, no matter what setting you are in, when everybody is pushing forward, what does the Bible say? Pull back. Well, guys, if you look to the left and you look to the right, you're not going to see many people pulling back with you. Very few pull back. Because in our minds and hearts and desires, we'd go, well, hey, listen, if so many people are pushing forward, obviously they probably know where they're going, right? Right? One of the worst issues, if you go to my wife and you go, what is Hunter the absolute worst at? She would say, without a shadow of a doubt, directions. And as I get older, I get worse, okay? And I'm okay with it, okay? Because my wife is amazing at it. And so one thing that I have learned in my awful nature of getting to where I need to go is I will look amongst others to find a way to get there. And so just recently, just recently, I was supposed to go to a funeral that was like an hour and a half away. And I left in time. I was ready. I knew where I was going. I was going to do good. Like it was a situation where I was going to go bless this family that didn't expect me to come. I was kind of excited to be there with them. I had good intentions, awful directions. And so we were in the middle of nowhere, GPS, no service. And I remember them texting me going, hey, Hunter, um, it's not actually going to be at First Baptist Church. It's going to be at a First Baptist building that's a few miles away. This is where it might be. It's near the Pizza Hut. I'm like, brother, all I heard was it's not by, you know, the actual First Baptist. I don't know what I'm looking for right now. I'm in trouble. That's all I knew. So I go in plenty enough time. And I get to this space and I go, I don't see anything. I don't know where I'm going and I don't have service. Can't call my wife. And all of a sudden, by, by the grace of the good Lord, I see four or five cars going in the same direction. And you know what I said? Well, they must be going to the funeral. <laughs> right? And so I said, okay, I'm going to get there and I'm going to tell Wendy I had no problem doing so. And so I get in line, I'm going with these five cars, and every left they take, everybody takes a left, every right, everybody takes a right. Oh man, praise God, it's going to be great. Drove an hour and a half. I pull into this building, I go, man, this is not a church, but they said it's not going to be a church, it might be right. I get out of my car, I walk in, and there is no funeral. It's a police luncheon hosted by the Rotary Club, okay? (laughs) Hour and a half, missed the funeral. I don't even get Pizza Hut, right? (laughs) Just because there are many going in the same direction does not mean that it's the direction that you're supposed to go or lead you to the place that you want to go. And so what does the Lord say? There's going to be times as faithful men, as faithful marriages, faithful parents, Faithful teenagers, faithful mamas, where the whole world is pushing forward. And what does he say? Hey, son, pull back. (laughs) Any of you guys ever pull back? And you pull back and go, well, no one, no one pulled back with me. Dad, who is doing these things? Many. 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 How many are on your road? How crowded is your path? The crowd, just because many are going in one direction, doesn't mean that it is the best direction. We see this no better, no heavier than Matthew 7. Let's slow it down. I want you to see it. 
Look at Matthew 7. Young people, don't lose me. Go to Matthew 7. When it talks about many, there's not a heavier verse that stands out. Let's give each other time. I want you to see it, guys. Look at Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. says, enter by the narrow gate. This is the words of Jesus. This is the Sermon on the Mount, which we've referenced. This is out of Christ's mouth. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are, what? Many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are, what? Few who will find it. Kind of skip down, look for that word many. Look at verses 21. Same chapter. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who is, he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 22. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The road to pain and disobedience is not only crowded, but it also is always willing to make room for more. Go back to Exodus. The road to pain and disobedience is not only crowded, but it is also a road that is always willing to make room for more. So follow me through the text in Exodus 23. We're going to read 2 again and go to 8. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute, so to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under his burden, you shall refrain from helping it. You shall surely help him with it. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in this dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous. For I will not justify the wicked. He says, son, this is how you live. This is how you live. Highlight eight for me. And you shall not take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the word of the righteous. For those who are free, for those who are saved, for those who are faithful, the many, the crowd, will always try to lie, pervert, entice, tempt, bribe, and blackmail you to join their crowd. Man, write this in your Bible. What will it cost for you to join us? Write that. Man, that'd be good small group stuff. What will it cost for you to join us? Do you know what a bribe means in its definition? It's defined as this. We see the word bribe, right? And you shall not take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning. The word bribe literally means a desired sum. So it could be money, it could be status, it could be person, protection, say whatever it is they promised you that you won't. A desired sum offered to another to change their decisions, their values, or their character to look a blind eye. Has the world ever offered you something that seemed too good to pass up? If you just join the crowd, you will be accepted. Doesn't it seem nice? We offer you more. That's what the crowd says to you. As everybody is pushing forward and you go, man, do I pull back? Do I push forward with them? Do I stay still? What do I do? What will the crowd always say? As you look to your left and don't see many, your right don't see many, the crowd looks back at you and they promise more. 
Why are you not pushing forward, Hunter? We promise you more. We promise you acceptance. We promise you safety. We promise you wealth. We promise you peace. I told you that we're working a little this morning, okay? I told you to put a tassel in 1 Thessalonians. I want you to see it. We usually don't flip this often and tell you to write things down, but it's too good not to, so stay with me, okay? Will you write down crowd, church, and Jesus? Crowd, church, and Jesus. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. The crowd says, I promise you more. I promise you safety. I promise you wealth. I promise you peace. Join us. Look at God's word. This is, this is wonderful. It, it really covers the whole gamut. Verses 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, right? Highlight three. For when they say, who's they? The crowd. Who's they, church? It's the many. When they say, peace and safety, peace and safety, push forward, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, but you, brother, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as the thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are mine, God tells them. You are mine. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, focused, right? Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of this hope of salvation. This is the gospel, highlight nine. For God did not appoint us to wrath, not by what you've done, not who you are, not of your goodness, not of your obedience. No. Why? But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we shall live together with him. Eleven, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. If you so gladly surrendered, so will I. We give you more. We promise you more. And what does he say? And when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them. And what we see is, I told you to write in your Bible, crowd, church, and Jesus. The crowd is many, the faithful are few, and Jesus is everything. Do you see it? The crowd are many. The faithful, the church, are few. And Jesus is everything. As we close here, more than anything, that Jesus is better than the crowd. That the few offer greater comfort than the many. That is the blessings of the church. The few offer more comfort than the many. And that a closeness with Christ turns loneliness to fulfillment in obedience. It's the idea of trading happiness to joy. And so this is something that um, we've talked many times. It's part of the narrative and language, just like alien status is. But it is a message that should be preached every Sunday. The things that bring you happiness are not bad. My children, my, my wife, money, vacations, ball, fun, like all of those hobbies, time with friends, grilling, coffee, all of those things, they make me happy. Happiness is not bad, but a man is held hostage by happiness. Because all of a sudden, all of those things that bring me happiness could be taken from me in a blink of an eye. The only thing that brings joy is Christ and Christ alone, which is unshakable. And so understand this. As the crowd, as the many, 
sprint towards happiness, let them run. Let them run. Pull back. And even though it might feel lonely, through joy, which is only found in Christ, you experience fulfillment. Kids, the crowd are many. The faithful are few. And Jesus is everything. This is how we close. This is the last time. Stay with me. I know this is the longer one. Go to Matthew. This is the end, okay? I want you to see it. I want this to be an encouragement through faith in Jesus. I want you to see it. Go to Matthew 5. As the world pushes forward, pull back. Walk the road less traveled. Submit to perfect parenting. Your heavenly Father is more than enough. Your heavenly Father is more than enough. We're going to read this and we're going to pray. Look at Jesus' words in 5, 1 through 12. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and then him opening his mouth, and he taught them, saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's what the sermon was. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You are going to be the few, but through Christ they shall be filled. That's fulfillment. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, the aliens, the ones who will speak the name of Jesus in all settings, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. When you are lonely, when you are on a road with not many, falsely for my sake, rejoice, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for they persecuted the prophets who were also before you. For those who are walking faithfully and pulling back as the world pushes forward, eyes on Christ, focus on salvation, stay faithful, alien status. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, as we said in the word, faith and obedience it is easier said than done. There are times where our faith will put us in positions where we feel lonely. We don't fit in. We're not a part of the crowd. There are times that we might not understand that there might be times that we don't want it. We believe that there's comfort in the many. There's temptation in the many. But there are not fulfillment in the many. Lord, I pray for endurance for these people. That's what I pray. It is not by their wisdom or their great decisions, only by the grace of God, through the finished work of Christ, we can ever be faithful. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit that lives within us hungers, hungers for faith and obedience. Lord, let us stay faithful. Let us encourage one another as we are the few. It's the gift of the church. Let us encourage other families that are being faithful, other marriages that are being faithful, other women that are being faithful, other men that are being faithful. For my young people who are in high school, stay faithful. Be the few. Why? Because Jesus is everything. Jesus is enough. Enjoy happiness, but let it go. Seek joy, which is only found in Christ. 
Thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for your son. In your precious name, the church says in harmony, amen.